Welcome to West of Eden. The series was created and narrated by the artist M. Walker Nelson. This series is a tribute to John Steinbeck, crafted from 2021 to 2023. There are 12 oil paintings, each measuring over six feet in size. The artist will now tell you why she painted the series, but it is only in an attempt to connect with you, the viewer. These are her stories, but it is the viewer who she hopes to inspire to find their own personal landmarks or icons. The artist welcomes emails through her website, mwalkernelson.com, and follow her on Facebook and Instagram, artsourcetx at Maggie Walker Nelson. Please enjoy the show. The Artistic Process In two years, each image is sketched and composed from a source photograph the artist took. Lists were made of images and ideas. The sketches were created and then the top 12 were selected. Two pilot pieces were created to test the glitch effect. The compositions were finalized and the canvases and materials were purchased. The artist was careful to select which had the most profound meaning rather than the easiest to paint. The canvases were toned for the landscape dominant compositions and burnt umber and sienna underpaintings were loosely applied, while others were painted directly on the gesso. The images were drawn out with meticulous measuring. Dark areas were indicated, and then the paintings were painted with traditional oil paint with a wet and wet application. The artist uses large brushes and minimal strokes, careful not to quote fix the painting. She aims for a flat style and a precise rendering of shadow to reveal the form. She prefers to arrange her compositions like a still life or a portrait to show the love for the objects. Let's start with a little bit about John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck was born in Salinas, California on February the 27th, 1902. At the time, it was a small oil town that his family had immigrated to from Europe. Steinbeck's father, John, was a county treasurer, and his mother, Olive, was a former school teacher who helped instill John's passion for literature and writing. He also had three sisters, two older and one younger. Steinbeck graduated from Salinas, California High School in 1919 and attended classes at Stanford University leaving in 1925 without a degree. Steinbeck worked manual labor in the fields of California before he traveled to New York by the way of the Panama Canal on a freight ship. While in New York, he worked construction and as a reporter before being denied publishing and soon returned to California. His first cup, Cup of Gold of 1929, was based on the pirate Henry Morgan. It was considered unsuccessful, but he was determined to keep writing. During the Great Depression, he and his wife Carol had to fish, garden, and occasionally steal, and eventually turn to welfare. His works often dealt with social and economic issues. He is best known for his novels about the Great Depression and its effects on families in America. He eventually returned to New York until he died in 1962 at the age of 66. During his career, he wrote 33 books and short stories and spent time as a war correspondent. His most famous works include Tortilla Flat, 1935, Of Mice and Men, 1937, The Grapes of Wrath, 1939, and East of Eden, 1952. Steinbeck was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Grapes of Wrath in 1940 and the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1962. West of Eden, series overview. West is just not a place, but a thing. The West has a temperament and a spirit all its own. We can get on board or we'll be driven out. It may even just kill you. The West also has its own sense of gravity. Once past the Mississippi, you may never come back. There's a sense of toughness, pride, and independence. West of Eden implies that some place could be better than the West with all its harshness. But maybe, just maybe. The title comes from John Steinbeck's novel, East of Eden, which describes a family that lived on the same land in California for generations. A pious father tries to guide two sons only to force their separation which is not unfamiliar to Cain and Abel. This show is a tribute to John Steinbeck. The artist M. Walker Nelson felt trapped in the West and that her life would begin once she could leave for the big shiny city. However, this is not a show on nostalgia. Look past the idea that this is simply a technically articulated record of the past as a backdrop. This show is for everyone who has lived in the outskirts or feel unseen in a flyover state. And from reading Steinbeck, Nelson learned some essential lessons about life that she shares in her work. First, one can now outrun oneself. Second, there is nothing wrong with a humble life. Third, sometimes it's the mistakes or character flaws that make the story worth reading. The artist struggled to be perfect and make something out of her life. She would only find freedom in painting, reading, and out on the open road. 
When I couldn't drive, I would draw and read, Nelson said. This is how I found Steinbeck. The landmarks that guided me, pre and post GPS, echoed the stories I read. It was not that I was nostalgic for another time. It was more that I felt alone, and I thought the old signs and silos did too. They once had great promise and a lot invested in their construction. What dreams did they once feel? Reading Steinbeck gave me the hope that I should just keep pressing on. We're one part destiny and one part tenacity. It all depends on what I choose, she said. I choose to keep putting one foot in front of the other. These are the icons I circled as I waited, and eventually the West became a part of me. I chose to stay. This show explores self-acceptance and the reckoning with time. Another component of Nelson's work is the passage of time. Few on earth have experienced change at such a rapid pace, she said. The last 150 years are radical compared to centuries that would pass without fundamental change in how people work, have relationships, eat, travel, administer medicine, and shelter. Nelson strongly feels that if she creates art void of this occurrence, she does no one any good and is squandering her calling. She explained, We get this tiny slice of time, and we have only to relay it accurately. We get so many laps around the sun, and I've burned through half already. We are all somewhat part in the analog digital battle. The visual effects in this series of paintings represent that all people are past and present. How exactly does one visually represent past and present in digital and analog? Nelson chose to show how our memories are like old tapes being played in our mind. In a second, we can travel time. But memories are only sometimes clear, and sometimes the reception could be better. Some memories are paused or on a loop, and others come like a glitch or flash. We have machines to do our dirty work and computers to help with our thinking. We have apps and delivery surfaces while the dishwasher hums. What do we do with our brave new lives, she asks. If we're talking about Americans, we work longer hours, overcommit ourselves and our children, only needing to come down from the running with endless streaming shows, social platforms, and drugs that cure all. Is this the dream of our predecessors? In some ways, yes. Nelson dares to investigate how technology does not make us less human, but amplifies our humanity. This series is a picture book torn from the artist's journal. Each piece is like a chapter of the book relating to the idea of what it is to live west of Eden. Each piece references Steinbeck's writings and how it parallels to Nelson's life. Bus. Growing up, my dad had fond memories of riding the Greyhound bus. He lived in a small Midwestern town surrounded by endless cornfields. He knew each ticket was a ticket to freedom. Throughout his life, he would still stop and eat at the bus station just because. Over the years, he saw much change, and after several decades, he decided again to take a trip on the bus. It was absolutely miserable. The seats were jammed together, it was overcrowded, and the only food stops were gas station convenience stores. Being frugal, he had bought a round-trip ticket, and he refused to abandon his journey. John Steinbeck wrote a book called The Wayward Bus in 1947 about bus travelers and what happened to the unlikely group. As he often did in his books, he used a typical setting to illuminate common mindsets about race, gender, socioeconomic status. Steinbeck was progressive for his day. His writing often showed the imbalances by being brutally honest and having the reader walk in the character's shoes. He did not preach a message in the fictional story, and many missed it. In this painting, the Greyhound bus almost flies, and the sky is reminiscent of the tail of a commercial jet. In our planned neighborhoods, virtual environments, and polarized media, it's easier to surrender ourselves to the like-minded, the like socioeconomic, and people who believe the same way that we do. Like bus travel, air travel is still one of society's great mixers, and it is almost always fairly miserable experience, but the people you meet make it interesting. Cowboy, or Amarillo Man. This painting is the painting, or rather sketch, that started this series. It happened kind of by accident. Steinbeck's books changed my perspective. I wanted to create a series that linked my world with his. I didn't want to be about the past, but instead I wanted to make it clear it's a dynamic view of the present. So how exactly does one represent this idea? The cowboy sign was my muse. I just worked a few blocks away. I lovingly took pictures of him from time to time, but he wasn't in the greatest part of town. So one Saturday I met a friend and we decided to take pictures of our aging downtown. On most days in the West, sunshine is expected, but it just so happened to be that we picked a particularly cloudy day. When I looked over the photos, the overcast sky removed the drama of the shadows. 
but I love the structure of the composition. The relatively flat horizon anchors the long road in the vertical sign. On my computer, I tried and tried to get the photo to look sunnier. Finally, I decided just to have fun with it and to quote, paint on it. I loved what I had created. A few months later, I was able to capture the same place on a sunny day. The two photos were combined and then left to sit. Over the next few years, this image would occasionally pop up, as it always would cause me to stop. The ideas began to take shape. When I had a working thesis, it was time to start preparing for the journey. I read more about Steinbeck and more of his books and writings. I made lists and pages of notes and sat for hours staring off in space, mentally painting the series. Slowly, 24 paintings came into view. I was then able to pare it down to 12. It was like pulling the pearl out of the ocean. There was excitement and terror to share. What would people think? It would change my life, or would I just throw it back in the ocean? My affinity for the neglected West is painted out like a love letter. Steinbeck wrote about the worker giving voice and story. My challenge is the people on the fringes, the regular people of all backgrounds and beliefs. Tell your story. It is valid. Tell it proudly. It is important. Eat. Sometimes simple is best. Take a chance and step right in. You can guess what's on the menu of this restaurant. The physical reference is no longer in existence. Across America, many rural downtowns are being scrapped for eBay or experiencing a quote, hometown or magnolia makeover, which seems to love a whitewashed fake old look. Thoughts on shiplap? When I first saw the sign, it symbolized the familiar. Three letters, once bright red and adorned in lines. Being a local is the comfort of meandering through town without checking reviews or getting advice. Places still exist that do not need a clever restaurant name and a corporately created logo. Probably the menu does not include anything vegan, gluten-free, or generally healthy. This sign is representative of all the hometown hole-in-the-walls where the owner is as likely to wait on customers as is to cook the food. Steinbeck described these places to a T. He would lavishly write descriptive paragraphs about the young waitress off in dreamland, the sweaty middle-aged owner battling flies with each door opening, the meringue's height and the tomato's slices. When someone lovingly crafts a vision, it's hard not to see your favorite dive and a new appreciation. John and Charlie, the red truck. Forward, perpetually moving forward. And although this is not Rosinante, Steinbeck's comfort truck, the red Ford Eco line was chosen for a reason. This truck is odd and impractical by today's standards, but it was considered a success by Ford in the 1960s. My point is to contrast Steinbeck's enduring literary contribution to generation. He captured a time in history, yet the story endures. This is a rare gift of a classic. When reading Steinbeck's work, there is no need for volumes of accompaniments and explanations to appreciate his genius. You enjoy it at face value. As an artist, this is my goal in creating work. A hundred years from now, will people be captivated when they see these paintings? And will the narrative still be plain? Or they look at the work and think it's odd and wonder if it was weird back then. I hope to be like the boss, as in Springsteen, and be the working man's artist. Or Chris Stapleton, who no one seems to mind seeing his country because the story and style cut to the soul. Only time will tell. John and Charlie are slightly faded in the painting, traveling through the badlands and travels with Charlie. I feel a bit faded and pressed on in this social and geographical change. I try not to worry about what others think, because ultimately, it does not matter. What matters is that I paint, because I have to paint. Lettuce Truck. Part of the title comes from the lettuce distribution in East of Eden, but is primarily symbolic of my grandfather's mint green truck with a white cap. He kept it parked out front, even though they had a new four tourist strut church. No longer on the farm, he kept it because he could fix it. The truck was handy for driving to the hardware store and when grandma was getting her hair done. During the depression, when they were children, my grandmother went south to the Rio Grande Valley to pick oranges. As my grandfather told it, they stayed and all but starved. I cannot see an old farm truck without thinking about Steinbeck's Great Morath. The truck itself was as much a character in the story as the way he described it, overloaded with a family and every possession they owned, creaking and moaning all the way to California. About 10 years ago, I had the chance to go to California for the first time. I was astounded at how nice and down-to-earth the people were, despite what the news says. 
when I told my grandparents about my experience, they just laughed and said, of course they're nice. They're just good old Okies and Texas folk. Motel. I used to dream of traveling the world. When I was 20, I started to roam. Not far at first, just an hour or two down an old highway, careful to make few turns and dragging my sister along to search for old gas pumps. I would always find a landmark to use on my way back. I had an atlas or written instructions, sometimes even printed sheets off MapQuest for more complicated adventures. On my first solo trip, a six hour drive, I chomped hard candy and feared stopping to get gas because my old car would not restart until it cooled off. Then a miracle, the cell phone with GPS. Then I got braver. Still, I rarely ventured further than I could make back home in one night. I would pre-book a hotel or have a camping reservation. Could I have ever boarded a boat or a wagon for uncharted lands? Why do travelers only stay in hotels they recognize the name? I would say, well, I'm a young woman traveling alone. But the truth is, I was only open to so much adventure. Ernest Hemingway said, no, that is the great fallacy, the wisdom of old men. They do not grow wise. They grow careful. Steinbeck grew up in a modest family, but influential in Salinas, California, and his mother encouraged him in the arts and writing. As an adult, he moved to New York and lived comfortably, traveled first class. And why is this important to the motel sign? I have passed it a million times saying, I'll stay there next time. It tells me not to be too hard on myself. Part of art is imagination. All we wish we were braver, tougher, wild, and free. The books and arts bring us closer to whom we wish we were. Through reading, we can travel time and geography. We can live vicariously for a while and then return to our normal lives. Nonfiction. When I read, I often wonder how much is true and how much is artistic liberty. After reading The Ends of Grapes of Wrath, I was mad and I called my dad. I said, that's not an ending. And he told me that when the book was written, the country was still in the depression and saw no end. Still unsatisfied, I thought Steinbeck could have returned later and tied up the loose ends. Great to wrap too, anybody? Fast forward to 2020. Living that nightmare made it clear some of the Jode family's choices. Steinbeck's books have an edge of uncertainty on the border of despair. 2020 fixed a new perspective on what those before us endured and realized that we, today, are entirely unaccustomed to hardship. As heartbreaking as it was when I lost my job in month two of the pandemic, and the same week my husband rode the chopping block for two years, it could have been much worse. We had no formula, no milk, no diapers, no wipes for two babies, but it was nothing like facing starvation or losing children to dust pneumonia. Nothing compares to a decade of fear with no safety nets and no dignity. When the things could not get worse during the depression, the country was attacked by Japan. In hindsight, books write World War II pulled America out of the Depression. But at that moment, I knew the fear of every mother. So why this image? This piece is about the birth of something beautiful while time marches on. Like the cactus, we may grow metaphorical spikes to protect ourselves, but we also mature in the unlikelihood of the circumstances. Beauty can come from wreckage if we are willing to adjust our perspective. This cactus and car are real. There is an abandoned car that has wings of a rocket and a giant cactus growing out of the trunk for the last 40 years. Some things change and are left behind. Some things endure as they always have. Things like hope, imagination, art, love, and cacti. Palace Theater. There was a time when all visual information came in through the movie theater on a printed page. In the theater, people are not alone. A unique phenomenon happens when people hear others laughing. We find things funnier. When humans see pictures of people smiling, they feel happier. Our brain wants to connect. And that is why we love celebrities. If we study them, then we will be like them, and we will be loved. America is the great creator of celebrity. Being rich for being famous, or being famous because of, well, who knows anymore. Being from California, Steinbeck was used to the migration of people dreaming to make it in Hollywood. The glitz, the glamour, the dream of bumping into Clark Gable. In the wayward bus, women of all ages would write long letters to him and hoping to meet him. Even Curly's wife, and of mice and men, was disappointed when she married fairly well. It did not fulfill her glamorous dreams as she had hoped. She was now tucked away on a farm, left to flirt with farmhands for attention. Today's delivery may differ, but the dream is just as alive. 
it even is potentially more obsessive. Now everyone, anywhere, can follow each second of a heartthrob and a real housewife as they gluttonly pour it out. There's no longer a need for a 90210 zip code to get noticed or to order a ring lighting and some editing software. Maybe you too will be tickety talk famous. The lives may be fake, but the money is real. For a time, as all Hollywood celebrities know. It was an illusion then, as even the name Palace implies, and it is an illusion now. Selena's Spirits. The West has a secret love-hate for alcohol. In the past, it was described as the vice of Satan and the destroyer of many young lives. For many years, it has been regulated and morality strictly enforced. But many blue laws are changing as old-fashioned values give way to tax revenue and convenience. This building was once a garage, but liquor seems to be more lucrative than fixing flats. It is named Selena Spirits after Steinbeck, as he knew the boom and bust of living in a smallish town with an oil history. He also had ups and downs with the drink. The liquor store is a sign of innocence, not unlike the innocence and virtue he bestowed on the drunkard Fasanos and Tortilla Flats, although he was much more generous with their flaws than I would have been. I was done with all of them the second time they used rent for wine. In Steinbeck's novel, Tortilla Flat, the characters are drunk who don't care or know about the world outside of them. They are, quote, free of commercialism and having nothing that can be stolen, and they make unending circles in the town. This liquor store in present day is a real place set outside the city limits of a small, dusty town that I once lived in. I got to know many Pisanos during that time. Men with no prospects, no plans, who would say, I can get a job welding tomorrow but never signed up for classes at the junior college. They'd hang out at the corner gas station. They were intensely loyal to their friend in the code of conduct, while staying drunk with moments of lucidity and arson. The Wild West still exists, with its version of crooked city councils and sheriffs, saloons, gambling halls filled with eight-liners that claim to only give out prizes instead of cash. Santa Fe. The new mother wrote, Interstate 40 cuts to the tops of Texas and links Amarillo to the rest of the country. I lived there for many years. Something to notice is a large sign downtown that says Santa Fe. One day I made a stupid comment that even Amarillo doesn't want to be Amarillo. To someone older who had lived there longer, he let me know it was the Santa Fe Railroad's building used to supervise nearly 6,000 miles of track. Oops, I'm an idiot, but an intrigued idiot. So I began to look into the words Santa Fe and what they stand for in the West. The words are Spanish, meaning holy faith. That's perfect. Is it not spiritual for Westerners to travel the open lands with only a car and God himself? The city of Santa Fe is the third oldest in the country. It was the name of the trail that led from Missouri to New Mexico. One in 10 died trying to traverse it. Then the railroad came through, linking Chicago to LA. The Santa Fe Company also dealt in land in the formation and growth of cities. Many of the small towns were simply there because there was a train station. Later, Route 66 was created for car travel. Eventually, I-40 replaced 66 and streamlined the road, cutting Santa Fe off the route. Santa Fe is also the third largest art market in the United States. Because of this history, it's not unlikely that the word Santa Fe are national icons and a strong personal one. Steinbeck wrote about passing through and staying in Amarillo. Most notable when his dog Charlie got sick and had to stay for a few days with a vet. Surely he walked my downtown in the same streets. I wonder if he took notes and if the Motel Cowboy sign existed then. Did he eat under the sign that simply said eat? Did he look up at the Santa Fe sign? No matter how often I see the Santa Fe sign, I feel homesick. And for a split second, my vision darkens into a tunnel as if I fell into the chasm of time. Silo. Silos reflect an aloneness, but not necessarily a loneliness. There is something to be said about getting out of the hustle of bustle to decompress and visually remove clutter from the horizon. Peace washes over the Westerner in direct correlation to percentage of ground touching the sky. Many times this painting has been shown, and an equal number of times people have explained, I know where this is, yet each location, they say, is very different. Be it a flat horizon of the plains or the distant mountains, the silo is a solid subconscious landmark made by man to rival nature. Like the biblical Joseph who saves the sons of Abraham with his grain stores, the modern silo is our symbol that we will survive and the pride of those who work the land. 
Thinking back on Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, one cannot help but think of the beauty of relationships formed in the West. Not always conventional, but symbiotic. When George looked for the next farm to protect Lenny, did he find them by scanning the horizon for silos? Often when I would get lost driving and miles turned into hours, I would find a distant silo and know I was getting relatively close to a town. Many of the silos I became familiar with and they stood as guideposts on my journeys. Silo and Train The effect in the sky represents what happens when a screen is viewed through another screen. Have you ever held your cell phone camera up to a laptop or TV to capture something? What you get are weird wavy lines. It's a digital phenomenon. It makes you wonder if there's something there all along we can't usually see. That is why small town life is a common theme in this show. I'll explain. Many towns across the West merely survive because of a single good they produce. We forget when at the store from where these items come. They always rest on the shelf, but get little outside of town, and there's evidence of their production. 2020 showed us that the supply chain is on a razor's edge. We don't think much if it's a bad year for peaches because they'll be shipped in from another country. But when the shelves are empty and quantities ration, we realize it's not all created by filling an Amazon cart. It takes earth, rain, sun, and people working the fields. Like the great and powerful Oz, we pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. But it wasn't just our food. When the world stopped, we had empathy and appreciated the roles of all people. Steinbeck worked hard to keep farmers and migrant workers in our mind. He did not just want us to forget that the food on our table was brought to us by a human life. In the West, coarse jobs can go overlooked. We provide beef, cotton, petroleum, and plastics, gravel for concrete, mine lithium and nickel for Tesla batteries. We sit in rows in data centers and walk miles inside familiar fulfillment warehouses while trying to teach kids in a town too small for a museum and direct flights. Westerners are smart, resilient, and free. These silos are obelisks to remind us of man's accomplishments, even in the middle of nowhere. Typewriter. Not part of the series, but part of series. This typewriter, the Oliver No. 9 Batwing, was probably different from the model John Steinbeck used for writing, or at least one that can be found in photos. Nevertheless, the model was available when he was starting his writing at Stanford. There is a reason, though, this model was selected. The typewriter is simple, yet has a dramatic silhouette. After a good rain, the color is reminiscent of the yellow-green vegetation in the California valleys where he set many of his books. Steinbeck's novels and short stories are unassuming characters and unassuming locations, but the story arc carries a punch. Another reason it was selected was his mother was named Olive. She was formative in his writing. Mothers are powerful influencers and artists. They often encourage the study, but tend to be critical of the production. The R was purposely omitted to form the word Olive. The artist chose a nod to the painter Whistler, who famously painted his mother by selecting a curtain background in mom. Steinbeck's wives, sisters, and mother greatly impacted him in the characters he crafted. Many have said Steinbeck was unfair to women, so why would a female artist love his work so much? Steinbeck did not write to put women in their place. Instead, he did like he did with all minorities, mentally challenged, and people experiencing poverty. He illuminated their condition during those times. He wrote from the perspective of a narrator so that the reader can see through the eyes of all characters. He showed how women have to navigate a controlled and unfair existence. He reveals their motivation and brings power and strength to a marginalized group. The artist Walker Nelson also feels it is vital for people today to read books written about the time in which they were written. This is the best way to see the truth both past and appreciate the social, medical, and technological advancements we have made. Streaming services love to revisit time periods and put a modern twist on them. But Americans must be careful to preserve an accurate history, all of it. To quote Clarence Brown in the introduction of the book We, novels about the distant past are also about the day in which they were composed. They're about that day's conception of the past and that day's information and delusions and nothing else. Therefore, the artist Walker Nelson paints what she knows, even if it has cell towers and phone lines in view. Who's to say these things may not exist in the future, and who is to make sure they at least become a footnote?